conversations to, to hold an event. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry to be incredibly rude uh, to interrupt. Right, good afternoon, everybody. It's very good to see you here this afternoon. Very good to see you here this afternoon at this event, which I'm delighted to be able to chair. So my name is Julia Black. I'm a professor here at the London School of Economics and Political Science, um, professor of law and regulation, work very closely and have done many, many years with Martin Lodge, who is the uh, head of CAR, the Centre for Analysis and Risk of Regulation, uh, whose banner got lost in the move, actually, we've had a lot of movings. Um, but that is a centre which has been going now for 20 something years. Uh, and does what it says on the tin. It analyzes risk and regulation and is um, uh, hosting uh, this evening along with our School of Public Policy and uh, LSE Press, which is our online open source digital uh, publishing um, enterprise uh, with um, Patrick Dunleavy over in the corner there is its uh, chief editor. So I'm delighted, uh, as I say, to be able to host this evening's event. Um, I've known Jeffrey for uh, quite some time, uh, not mainly because we dragooned him into teaching on the MSc in regulation uh, many, many moons ago, uh, and have managed to, to build up that few hours on a Friday afternoon into being um, pretty much most of his working life now, so I'm <laughs> delighted uh, at that. Um, and the book that he has just published on Spectrum Auctions, for me, takes one of those very um, highly technical, not even apparently technical, highly technical areas but which is absolutely fundamental to our digital communications and therefore to our political and social uh, and economic infrastructure. Now I'm not, for me I have a very lay person's analogy of spectrum which is going to horrify uh, all the specialists in the room. I just like to think about it as swim lanes um, and you basically have those people when you go into the swimming pool who are really faster than you and trying to bear you down and that's really annoying and then you are in a the lane, and then you've got the people who are just much slower than you. And it's trying getting people in the right swim lanes, but in a public pool, <laughs> you can choose where you want. Uh, obviously, we need a little bit more allocation going on if we're going to do this across markets. So I'm here to learn, as you can tell. Um, but I'm also here to learn from Jeffrey, but also from our uh, marvelous panel. So online joining us uh, from, I think, from the west coast of the US is uh, Professor Paul Milgram. Um, you probably know, needs no introduction, but I'm going to introduce him anyway, and Paul is waving. Thank you very much, Paul, for joining us at some uh, very early hour of the morning for you. So Paul is the Shirley and Leonard Ely Professor of Humanities and Sciences in the Department of Economics and Professor by Courtesy at Stanford Grad Graduate School of Business, member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Sciences, Director of Market Design Pro Program at CEPA, and, and more, but, but we have a, a book launch to get back to. Um, so very, very glad that you could well, you could join us uh, today, Paul. Thank you for that. Also delighted that we have Martin Ballantyne here, who is Ofcom's General Counsel and Legal Group Director and has been Legal Director at Ofcom's since 2011 and provides advice in all policy areas with Ofcom and does generally what legal does, which is basically try and keep an organisation out of trouble. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> finally, uh, Inga Hansen, who's uh, Senior Vice President, Head of Regulatory Affairs, at TDC Net, and then previously you were director. Um, so, so I'm telling you, really, this is your life. No, you were director <laughs> of regulation at BT and uh, UK, and director of uh, regulatory affairs and spectrum at EE, the mobile um, operator. So the format uh, for this afternoon is um, Jeffrey will give us some key um, insights from his book. I'll then have some Q and A with the panel, and then we'll open it up for questions. We've got people joining online as well. Welcome very to you. Uh, please do post your questions in the chat or Q&A, in the Q&A function, um, and we'll turn to you and make sure that you get a good look in as well. Okay, thank you very much. Jeffrey, over to you. Thank you very much. So um, it's, a, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here um, with so many family, friends, colleagues and acquaintances present in the room and, and of course, online as well. Um, I was stimulated to write this book uh, after learning an enormous amount over a decade or so as a practitioner working on UK spectrum auctions and feeling that much could be gleaned to uh, um, assist others to understand what spectrum auctions are about 
uh, to help practitioners around the world work on their own auctions and to draw out some wider lessons about public policy. So I would say that the book encapsulates uh, many of the preoccupations over my career about bridging academia and uh, practical regulation and drawing on a wide range of techniques and fields of study um, as of course is very much reflected in the, uh, in the multidisciplinary makeup of the panel we'll be hearing from very soon. Just before we, we do so, uh, I'll briefly introduce the book and outline a, a, a few of the key themes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, <laughs> I mean, many of you know an enormous amount about the radio spectrum, but for those of you who don't, here's a sort of simple introductory uh, illustration. Uh, radio spectrum are essentially airwaves that are used to transmit information. And the diagram illustrates just a few of the hugely wide range of wireless communication services uh, that, are, that, are, that are available. And uh, spectrum uh, uh, for cellular mobile services is highlighted in, in bold. Now, mobile spectrum sits in what's often referred to as a sweet spot, uh, which balances coverage and bandwidth, which is the trade-off shown at the bottom of the, of the slide. Uh, it's low enough in frequency that the signals uh, travel far enough to enable good quality coverage. And it's high enough frequency bands to provide fast data speeds. Now, of course, you can use the spectrum to provide all kinds of clever services, and here's just a few sort of simple illustrations of some services already exist and others that, that um, other innovations that may uh, develop to change the way that uh, we, we live and work. And uh, for example, uh, mobile money there on the top right hand corner, I was in Africa a few weeks ago and it was very striking to me how prominent mobile money is as a, as a means of payment, providing much needed financial infrastructure there. So in order to provide these, these clever, smart, innovative services, um, licenses giving rights to use radio frequencies for mobile spectrum are these days usually awarded by auction. And the map just shows, uh, I've added just a few of the examples of countries uh, that are expected to hold auctions later this year. And as you can see, they, they're, they are, they're across many, many different continents. So practitioners put auction theory into practice, although there's an undoubted skill in understanding which aspects are most relevant or important to take away from the, the theory. And theorists can learn from the complications and new challenges that are thrown up by messy real world experiences. And that's why I describe the relationship between theory and practice as symbiotic two-way learning. Spectrum auctions have been at the forefront of developments in auction design because of the uh, challenges they present. Some auctions have a single, some auctions in general have a single objective like maximizing revenue. So for example, fine art auctions and the world record for that is uh, was in 2017 for Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which went for 450 million US dollars, which by standards of spectrum auctions isn't a particularly <laughs> large amount. <laughs> Uh, but you also have things like uh, sports rights, broadcasting rights for sports, or contracts for cricketers to join uh, Indian Premier League teams, for example. <laughs> Had to get a reference to cricket in there somehow. <laughs> um, now, Spectrum auctions have multiple objectives, which is one of the sources of complications, and very prominent amongst that being kind of a, a, a valuable public scarce resource is efficient allocation of Spectrum. But in addition to that, because Spectrum is an input, as we've, as we've seen, to provide these sort of these downstream clever wireless services, there are also crucial effects on what happens in the auction and also what happens in the so-called downstream markets, such as the competition between mobile operators to compete for retail customers and for the services that we all use on our, on our smartphones. And indeed, obviously, for the quality of coverage, particularly in, in rural areas, uh, which is often kind of patchy. So another source of complication is that spectrums are usually awarded in granular blocks, um, or there can be quite often on multiple frequency bands in the auction. And that means that the blocks or bands can be substitutes for one another, or in some cases they can be complements, 
meaning the whole is worth more than the sum of the parts and there are synergy values. And that variety complicates the auction design choices uh, to allow bidders to express the different aspects of their, of their valuations for the spectrum as, as the bidders in the auctions. And because mobile markets are, are, are oligopolies, that means there's a relatively small number of bidders in spectrum auctions. And in turn, that translates into strategic bidding just being an occupational hazard. Now, in a sense, to achieve efficient allocation, all the regulator, I say all the regulator is trying to do, is um, incentivize the mobile companies to bid truthfully, bid truthfully their, their spectrum valuations. But all those complications I've just been through uh, uh, mean that that apparently or superficially simple task is, is not just incredibly difficult, it's in some sense probably impossible because there is no such thing as a perfect auction design. And that means there's always trade-offs involved. Now, this is a, a, a diagram from the book, which just illustrates the range of steps that are involved for a, a regulator designing and then implementing a spectrum auction. And all of these do involve degrees of trade-off. So you can see from the, the top row, that's about getting hold of the spectrum to auction and deciding how to license it. And then there's the guts of the auction design challenges in the second and third rows, practical implementation issues in the penultimate row, and post-auction events in the bottom row, like learning lessons for the future. <laughs> now the book goes through all of those, but you'll be delighted to hear I'm not gonna go through all of those right now. Um, I'm just gonna focus on, on one of them, uh, which is just to bring out one of the themes of the book, which is to try and develop analytical frameworks to assist making those trade-offs that I was referring to. So I've always been a fan of frame, frameworks over, over my career. I think they can help to identify the relevant considerations that are involved, to organize the evidence, and to guide the necessary policy judgment. Because there's always going to be judgment involved, and the framework doesn't give the answer, but hopefully it gives a route to a more kind of better answer within a sort of consistent overall approach. Now, quite a common mistake in spectrum auctions is, is in setting reserve prices. Sometimes they're set too low, but I, I think probably more often they're set too high and sometimes leading to unsold spectrum. And this is uh, the, the these two part analytical framework uh, hopefully can be utilized when thinking about how to set reserve prices. So the first part is on the left hand side, uh, there's the trade off between factors, some of which suggest setting higher reserve prices and some suggesting setting lower prices. And the applicable local circumstances will affect how that seesaw should be balanced such as lower prices to allow the auction to do its job of price discovery and to reduce risks of, le of leaving spectrum unsold and, and not being used for the benefit of, of the public. The second part on the right hand side is the nature of the available evidence when judging uh, that balance, such as the relevance and reliability of the available evidence um, uh, about the, the value of the spectrum. Now, there are some cases where there's plenty of data available and it's, it's a bit of an easier task to set reserve prices, but it's also quite common for the useful data to be quite limited. And there I would certainly favor a sensible approach being to set the reserve price low enough to be confident that it's below the market value. And that's about prioritizing selling the spectrum and getting into productive use to benefit consumers. Uh, there are a couple of practical examples of, of the approach of sometimes setting very low prices in the face of a very limited or, or in some cases even absent evidence on, on the value of the spectrum before the, before the auction. And that was done, I would say, in the UK's 2013 and 2021 auctions. And it played out, I think, quite successfully in both cases, but a bit differently. In 2013, auction bidding for the so-called 2.6 gigahertz unpaired spectrum, which probably means something to half of people in the room and nothing to the other half. Um, uh, but the bidding there from a very low reserve price because there was so much uncertainty about what the value of that spectrum was, that led to the price discovery and it took the final prices a long way above those low reserve level. In 2021, it was a bit different. The, the reserve price for the 700 megahertz supplementary downlink spectrum Again, a pretty low reserve price was set for that, and it sold at that reserve level, and indeed it only attracted a single bid. Um, and at a higher, higher price, 
a higher reserve price had been set, they might well have been unsold and, and not been available to be put to, to, into use. So that's just an example, as I say, and there are many other frameworks uh, uh, developed in the book to assess practical decision making for all of those decisions that I showed on the, on the previous slide. Now, another key theme uh, is about the value of learning from experience. In each country, there's nearly always a sequence of auctions from going back many years to 2G to 3G, 4G, 5G, and potentially 6G in due course. 6G will happen, the spectrum requirements for it are not yet clear. Um, and sometimes there are opportunities to learn from other countries' experiences. Now, you can't read across simplistically from one case to another because the individual conditions are always important to selecting the, the design that's best attuned to the particular circumstances. Now, I'm not, I mean, the detail on this slide is just to, it's just there to provide specific examples of, a, of wider points about the importance of learning. You can learn, obviously, from things that go wrong, but you can also learn from things that go right. And it's also, I think, uh, important to adapt in a horses by courses approach to the nature of the spectrum in the auction, such as whether it's substitutes or more likely to be substitutes or complements, the market conditions, and the state of knowledge, because refinements in new auction formats are constantly being developed in many cases by, by one of our, our panel contributors, Professor Paul Milgram. Now, just finally, um, coming back to the structure of the book, it's in two parts. And part one is very much designed for those without prior knowledge of radio spectrum and auctions. And it provides an introduction, builds up some key issues, sets out practical examples, and then delves into the risk, the role of um, experts in public policy processes. Um, and that I think is something we may explore further in the panel discussion. And then part two provides greater depth in a step-by-step -step guide to designing and implementing uh, an auction. And colleagues from LSE Press are over there in the corner of the room and they have copies of the book, which will be available for purchase later on. <laughs> Although of course you can download it for free from the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not on commission, so it's no, 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 no conflict of interest. <laughs> so anyway, that's me done. Without further ado, I'm really happy to hand over to Julia and look forward to the panel discussion very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to turn to um, Professor Milgram Paul to you first. To I mean, Jeffy set out various different um, considerations there to, for us to think about, or those designing and running auctions to think about. But for you, what are the most important things to do or to avoid doing in, in a spectrum auction? Uh, well, thank you. First of all, I just want to uh, thank you for inviting me. And, and Jeffrey, what a, what a marvelous book. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful uh, uh, approach that you've taken being as comprehensive as you have that I haven't seen anybody else even attempt anything like that. So I just want to begin by uh, uh, congratulating Jeffrey on this wonderful accomplishment. And I think, you know, um, the first kind of answer I would, in any other audience I would give to this question is to be careful about the range of objectives that you, you have to be careful about overgeneralizing and uh, not taking uh, uh, a design that's been chosen for one context and apply it to the others because the objectives may vary in uh, from one context to another. But the circumstances can also vary, and, and Jeffrey said less about uh, that in his introduction here. So let me remark that, you know, the, the number of bidders, for example, the small number of bidders that you typically see in auctions in the UK is pretty different from what you typically see from auctions in the United States where uh, often there are a larger number of bidders. And, and so concerns about, uh, for example, collusion and market division may be uh, uh, less, less worrisome in, in one market uh, than in another. So context matters too. And another, uh, another way that context matters that uh, uh, is, the, is where, what existing rights look like. So when, when we did the incentive auction in the United States where we were trying to move spectrum from one use, uh, television broadcasting, and into another use, uh, mobile broadband, the uh, the rights of the existing user played a role. And that's that was novel and pretty unusual. Uh, so so context matters too. 
And I think, you know, Jeffrey has given us the most complete um, uh, um, uh, analytical framework that we've ever seen pulled together for, for the design of auctions. And it, and it represents, if I can go beyond your question a little bit, it represents a way forward too, because, you know, right now, Jeffrey, you won't know this, but I've been working on water auctions uh, recently and, and the uh, complexities there, the same kinds of complexities, the existing rights holders, the law that exists, the suitability for of, of different sources for different uses, all need to be taken into account. And so I also am, am hopeful that Jeffrey's framework can be expanded even beyond radio spectrum to guide the way we think about other kinds of important applications. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and Inga, can I turn to you because you've been on the other side, obviously, of this uh, this process. From your point of view, what are some of those most important considerations? Sure. Um, okay. So I, I would also just like to start by congratulating you, Jeffrey, on, Jeffrey, on your most uh, excellent book, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so I can provide a bit of perspective. Um, I was bidding in the UK. Um, 2013 and 2018 auctions, but of course, these are my personal views and not, of course, what sensitive or what bidders. But um, I think, you know, from a bit of perspective, um, should auctioneers uh, innovate or, or stick with uh, the same uh, framework? I would say, um, yes, definitely horses for courses. Innovation um, is good, but um, within reason, <laughs> And when I say within reason, I say that because um, auctions of mobile um, spectrum are very important for mobile operators. Um, it is, um, you know, uh, the single um, biggest investments we make, um, and it is very important to the services we can offer to uh, customers. And you, you don't want to feel like a lab rat in that situation where you're trying to manage such important issues um, for the business. Um, so I guess um, a couple of uh, op observations around that. Um, I think, and, and this I think is tied a little bit with what you were saying, Professor Milgram. I think that a really important aspect is to think about um, which policy questions to take into the auction and which policy questions are better decided um, in <laughs> advance so as not to overcomplicate. Um, the auction, and I think, um, uh, from my perspective, the incentive auction um, that you just mentioned, Professor Milgram, is, is a good example of a really difficult policy question solved by an auction. I think, and you mentioned this yourself in the book, um, Jeffrey. I think, for example, this question of low power um, use in the 2.6 band was a question we did not need to take into the auction because I think it was pretty pretty clear in advance what was the highest value use of that um, spectrum. Another example, and you mentioned this as well, is, is um, having an unbundled auction for um, lower subsidy for coverage obligations, for example, I think is also a good question to take into an auction and use the market um, to figure that one out. Um, and then I suppose another aspect is also, um, I think, using innovative auction designs to me show a degree um, uh, or willingness to take risk on behalf of the regulator. Um, and actually, I think it's really important that the regulator takes that willingness uh, beyond the auction and to questions of spectrum allocation between auctions as well. Um, from my perspective, there seems to be a little bit of a, an imbalance there when we come to an auction, all sorts of things can be considered, but we should also be able to consider those in between auctions because the um, objective is the same to achieve um, efficient spectrum allocation. So I suppose those were sort of my reflections on the book um, and the questions you raise. Um, and then one thing that kind of did uh, think, which is a more detailed thing that, that did strike me is that um, from the bidder perspective is, is about information policy, because usually the auctions I have been involved in um, as a stakeholder, the preparatory phase has not thought so much about the information policy. Of course, it is an aspect, but perhaps not thought so much about that and also how it interacts with the auction design. So that could be an area for more um, research. When, when you're in an auction 
Rome, as some of you here know, <laughs> you, uh, with limited information in the auction, you spend an inordinate amount of time trying to guess what your competitors are doing. Um, and it matters, it matters to your valuation, you know, because Spectrum decides partially what kind of service you can provide to your customers and therefore what kind of competitors are you going to be and ultimately what market share you might, um, you know, retain or gain. Um, and I think some of the auctions you discussed in your book as well, Jeffrey, particularly the 2013 auction, I think the lack of information interacted um, with some of the more complex uh, features of the auction to provide some sort of looking funnies where, where perhaps uh, mistakes were made. Um, so, so that's an, an, an area that could maybe warrant more research. Those were some of my reflections from a, from a bit of perspective. Excellent. So just going to say, we're going to have to pass my phone. Um, so, so, Martin, just before I bring you in, there were a few things there that actually both um, Paul, you brought out and Inga, you brought out that Jeffrey, I'm going to ask Tone to you first and then and then broaden it out. But this issue of what policy issue should be brought into the auction and which should be left out, um, particularly if we're thinking of auctions in, in other contexts as well, allocation of other types of other types of uh, common resources, as it were. So what, what to your mind are the types of policy questions that auctions can resolve? And what's the types of policy questions that actually should be left out for some other policy mechanism to address? Thank you for that. Good question. Uh, <laughs> I think I might sort of offer at least a framework to think about that. Uh, it's what I talk about in the book is about thinking about the kind of the market failure and the regulatory failure. Because, you know, if you, if you take the decision before the auction on the basis of that's a regulatory decision using the information the regulator can, can obtain and to interpret, and many things can go wrong in doing that, particularly if it's really quite a hard question. You, you've already pointed, Inga, to a few of those things that are really quite hard to know in advance, and there's a high risk of regulatory failure. On the other hand, you know, the market failure question is whether you can set up all kinds of very clever uh, mechanisms to allow many, many different things to be, uh, to be sorted out through bidding. But the question is, is that going to be useful? Is that going to be informative? Is that going to lead to what looks like a, a good outcome, a good efficient outcome? So I think really that's the way I'd probably answer that question, uh, Julia, is it's, it's thinking about the balance between those two things. Is the mechanism that you're setting up likely to be effective relative to the risks of getting it wrong if you have to make a regulatory decision before the auction? Uh, Paul, can I turn to you, actually, for your reflections on, on that question? Sure. Of policy questions, yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think... Uh, um, uh, I. First of all, echoing what Jeffrey said, you you uh, want to look at risks and failures. But the other thing you want to look at is um, what are the alternate ways of dealing with the problem. There, are, you know, some uh, sometimes you can just allow uh, trading among the people who have acquired Spectrum to uh, uh, to to rationalize uh, problems that you didn't, you didn't have to design a fancy, complicated auction for. One of the things I guess I have learned over over the years that I was less cognizant about when I began is the number of mistakes that bidders make in the auctions. We we start off with um, in economic theory assuming that our our agents all optimize and are rational and and actually lots of mistakes get made uh, and keeping things simple becomes a uh, uh, paramount then and we have to always add you know ask ourselves is is the complexity worth it because we increase the risks of errors when we make uh, our, our auctions more complicated. And are there other ways of, of uh, dealing with these issues? Some of these things, there's not other ways of dealing with. You know, when you decide whether uh, uh, you're, you're going to have paired spectrum, for example, and uh, uh, versus unpaired, it's very difficult to uh, 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 straighten that problem out if you get it wrong to begin with. Um, but in, in other cases, uh, the the... Uh, uh, the, 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 you can rely on, on just the winners of the auction to make adjustments that they need to make to coordinate their uses. And there's no need to uh, build complexity into the design to make those things happen. Interesting. I think there's a lot there that we're probably going to come back to um, in the, in the Q&A. Um, and I could um, 
I could ask you loads of questions actually on this. But the next, the other thing that I think comes out from this is in terms of the complexity of the design, there's not so many inter-moving parts, like a very sort of finely balanced machine. And I can see different elements could work well uh, with different others and others might jar. And coming on to this issue, you put, you said, Jeffrey, about, well, what's your risk of regulatory failure? And I want to play that into the issue about innovation in design. So Martin and I have a long history in, in regulatory innovation, having edited a book in this back about 20 years ago. But anyway, um, in terms of how regulators innovate, what motivates them to innovate, but it plays into this issue of, of risk, because obviously if you are innovating by nature, you are taking a risk. So, so how do you, how can regulators, but also regulators are constantly being encouraged with another push now to, to facilitate innovation, therefore to be innovative themselves in the, the way that they, they do that. So how can regulators innovate safely in the context of an auction? Well, they can never be completely safe. I mean, it's, as you say, it's risk and there's a sort of risk rewards uh, uh, trade-off to strike. I suppose if I sort of take a step back and think about, you know, history of spectrum auctions, it's always involved degrees of innovation. You know, one, one of the early auctions, which uh, Professor Milgram uh, was a key designer of, was, uh, was, in, uh, was in the US in 1994, which really, you know, was, was, was one of the very early auctions. It was one that really brought in a lot of expertise, a lot of auction mm. theory. And it used an auction design, which is still being used today, albeit in sort of very, in, in sort of modulated form, with various refinements, et cetera, having been developed over, over time. And that's what I call in the book the simultaneous multiple round ascending auction. Um, it hadn't been used before. I mean, um, you know, actually, Professor Milgram's talked about how he sort of was inspired by um, silent charity auctions and then adapted that for some of the weaknesses and that and, and thought about other ways to uh, to improve things, you know, um, to allow, um, I mean, the attraction being offering things simultaneously was a bit of an innovation at that stage because the items in the auction were substitute and it allows bidders to switch between them rather than having, if you run them sequentially, you know, bidders have got to say, well, what's it going to go for in future auctions in order to determine how they bid in the first auction? And that's a hugely complicated, difficult strategic problem. So I think ch new challenges throw up scope for fresh ideas. And, you know, and then in some sense, uh, because there are so many spectrum auctions being run around the world and in any country, it's a repeated game. There are a number being run in a kind of sequence over the years. There are opportunities for for learning and to, and to make lots of sort of refinements and improvements and then new, new auction formats kind of get developed to, do, to address new, new challenges. And Paul Milgram referred to the, the broadcast incentive auction in the US, which was, again, very innovative, hadn't been, hadn't been used before and was addressing some hugely complicated policy problems. So that doesn't mean you should be reckless, the fact that you, know, you can refine things later on, but I think it does, you know, if you think about it as a sort of longer term evolution, you know, if there's a, if there's a, you know, ultimately it has to be a calculated risk, but in the knowledge that in future more will be understood. And sometimes you'll, some people will think you've gone down a dead end. And uh, which I know, for example, for the commentator or clock auction, some people in the room probably do. I don't personally hold that view. I think it has its place. But that was a, one of the innovations that Ofcom was quite, uh, was quite, um, was one of the sort of leaders, one of the early adopters of. But when it was first used, there was some prior testing, some simulation, Done, etc. Um, but a lot more has been understood about it when it's actually been used in the real world in a number of different contexts and it's worked well in some places and not so well elsewhere. And then you understand more about it and understand what place it has within the sort of armory of different potential options uh, in terms of auction formats. So calculated risks and opportunities for refinement over time. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, come on that because I think the other aspect to be cognizant of, and now I, I haven't been a regulator, but I very much appreciate this aspect, which is that you know there are other concerns. And if you take risks and design a you know hugely complex novel auction that no one has seen before, then that is probably okay for big bidders, for mobile operators who will source the best consultants in the market and you know prepare themselves. But it may actually form a barrier to, um, you know, other smaller, less well-resourced bidders coming into the auction. And of course, in the case of Ofcom, you know, there's a, 
um, an obligation to also uh, look at promoting competition in the market. So, so you can have other concerns, I imagine, that will also influence how much, how much risk you're willing to take. I mean, I, I very much agree with that. I would say innovate, but be clear why, why you're innovating. And I think the key for that is being clear about what are your objectives for this auction. Uh, and actually, that takes me back to a, a, a sort of maybe a, an earlier point that Professor Morgan Wilson made, which is I actually think it's quite important to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and there is uh, there is always temptation, uh, and not just temptation, but urging from many different parties to to add this and that and the other to the auction. And I think you can you can sometimes find as a regulator, I, you need to step back and ask yourself are we trying to do too much in this auction and can we actually achieve it all? And you asked the question earlier about what policy, what, you know, what policy objectives can you achieve through an auction, which ones can't you? You could probably do quite a lot, but sometimes trying to do many of them at the same time uh, starts risking that you don't actually achieve any of them. So, you know, I've, we've had many debates in Ofcom at various different times about, you know, are we, are we seeking to promote competition through this auction? Are we are we trying to buy something? Are we, are we for example, a coverage obligation? Are we are we essentially trying to get an operator to commit to spending you know more money on uh, on rolling out a network to a, a particular level, and therefore spend less money in the auction? Does does that have the risk of of uh, of distorting the actual allocation in a way that means you end up with an overall worse outcome? Those are all things that, as a regulator, you're going to be thinking about as you're as you're working out what your rules are going to be, and you can you can achieve almost anything through an auction. And there's plenty of people in this room who who have who have devised very very clever auctions. I think if you make it too complex, uh, you certainly run the risk that actually there's very few people who can actually participate because they need the best advisors to be able to do that. But you also need to be able to explain the auction and its outcome to people and often to people who have no expertise at all, but who are quite important to you. So for example, you know, the relevant government department will at some point or other probably need to make a statement about it. If you can't explain to uh, a politician uh, or indeed within your own within your own organization, if you can't explain to the CEO why the result is has been the result and, and how the bidding led you there, you've probably got a bit of a problem to be honest. And, and the more complex the auction design, the more complex that can be. Brilliant. Um, can I add? Um, Absolutely, please do, because I know you've got to leave it um, in just under five minutes, uh, Paul, to go and teach, which is a very noble thing to do. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I am going to milk you for all, all we can <laughs> while we've got you here. So please. <laughs> please yes, I, I, I do have a class to teach, and I, I just want to echo what we've just heard, because uh, I, I think you know the question was originally posed as one about being innovative. And I think the shift, which was the right shift, was uh, to the issue of complexity. Uh, sometimes the innovations are simplifications, and, and uh, I, I applaud those all the time. You know, we, we we like to have things being simple, and and we've also been very abstract. And so I just wanted to say, for the benefit of the audience, to give another example um, along these lines that sort of uh, emphasizes what we're talking about. When we were designing the incentive auction in the United States, the the um, where we ended up deciding whether to buy or not buy the broadcast rights of, of uh, any individual TV station. Um, we had a couple of problems. At the beginning, it was suggested that we ought to buy interference rights from people, different levels of interference rights, because we might not need the entire area covered by a station. We might uh, only need you know 90% of it and uh, might be able to just buy interference prices uh, uh, rights for a lower price. We decided not to do that because it added so much complexity uh, to the auction that it would be harder for the bidders to figure out what to do. And they would have to be comparing, what does it mean that I'm selling you know, a 10% uh, interference right and uh, as opposed to selling my station? And, and then again, the, the, although the uh, auction design itself was very novel, it was designed to be maximally simple because as as was one of the panelists pointed out a moment ago, a lot of these bidders were really small businesses. Somebody has a, a television station in Topeka, Kansas that his grandfather set up in the 1950s. And they're not really sophisticated uh, business people who are going to be able to uh, 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 
strategize in an auction of, of high complexity. So the uh, the innovations that were made were innovations aimed at simplifying. So I, I, I'm trying to uh, respond to the way the question was originally posed, but is about the risks of innovation. We, we uh, pay great attention to worst case analysis. We pay great attention to simplicity and all of those things come together to, uh, um, uh, to you know, in, in recommending what is a good design. It's not just about uh, innovation involving risk, but risk can be raised by complexity and, and other features as well. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with with uh, everything that's been said by the by the fellow panel members. Uh, one other theme, which I think is sort of implicit or lurking around here, which I sort of wanted to make explicit, is about trust and the importance of trust. I think you know the regulator running the auction needs to be trusted because if you're not trusted, then it affects how the market's going to work, and it's not going to work very well. You know. Bidders will want to protect themselves and they don't trust what's going on. Some of those things go to complexity, but they go to the question of small bidders that both Inga noted and, and Paul's also just commented on. So now obviously you, you get trust if you're trustworthy. So I think there's quite an important question here about reputation. And certainly, you know, when I was at Ofcom, Ofcom spent a lot of efforts in you know doing things which were you know of intrinsic value in themselves, but also were about building a, a reputation. For being open, transparent, and trustworthy, uh, you know, and that goes to some of the sort of the wider points that Inga was referring to in terms of information policy. How much gets published before and after the auction, as well as there are questions of what the bidders get to see during during the auction. So I think this this question of trust and trustworthiness is also actually very important. So, Martin, I'm going to turn to you actually because it strikes me that um, there are there are many many pools of different expertise. That you have within here so we've got trust trustworthiness we've got obviously the legal dimension we've got a very technical dimension we've got game theory going on we've got all auction theory we've got economists in the room etc so how to embed not only expertise in decision making but actually to facilitate conversations and communications really across all these different areas of expertise yes thank you well this is definitely an area where we we've, we've not had enough of experts have we yet because there are there are a lot of experts involved in in spectrum auctions and and you need them but you need to use them in the right way uh, and i think i think i was going to cover two areas one is actually the role of experts in in setting up if, if you're the authority uh, setting up an auction and running it and then how how you best embed people into into that decision making process so I think I think the role of experts. There are probably uh, there are at least four areas where you're going to need them. The first and most obvious is obviously when you're actually devising the auction. So when you're designing it, when you're working out what you want to do, what you want to, want to achieve, and there you're going to need you're going to need economists, you're going to need mathematicians, you're going to need all sorts of different different expertises. You then come onto the point that I made earlier, which is you also need people who can explain the auction, and uh, not you need people who are able to explain very complex things actually very simply to, to people who may be the ultimate decision makers on some of these things, but who undoubtedly will not have the expertise that you necessarily have. And so I think a, a skill of a good expert is actually being able to make the very complex actually quite straightforward or is straightforward enough. And um, you then need people to actually run the auction and running the auction for those of you who, who haven't been involved in one before, uh, it's it requires quite a lot of decisions to be made at, at sometimes at quite significant pace, particularly if things go wrong, which inevitably at some point or other, they they almost always something un, unexpected happens. And, uh, you know, I know Ofcom, we've, you know, we spend a lot of time practicing auctions in advance. And I know all the bidders do as well. It, just for that occasion when something that you didn't think was going to happen does happen. Uh, and you hope that you, you thought about it in advance. And sometimes you did and sometimes you didn't. Uh, and then lastly, you will need experts if you need to defend your decisions in court. And obviously that's close to my heart and I think close to Jeffrey's heart because he, he has done that on, on a number of occasions. And, and there I would say the, the crucial thing as an expert is, is knowing what your role is uh, and understanding that your role in court is to assist the courts to make a decision. It is not to advocate for the the position that that you are you know that you may have been involved in 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 devising uh, and a good expert recognizes yeah. that and helps the court and and to be honest a less good expert does advocate and it doesn't it tends not to go very well 
Um, I think also there, the, there is a very important point that as an expert, you need, you need to be very clear about what you do know and what you don't know, uh, particularly in court. Uh, the worst thing that an expert can do is, in a sense, start making it up as they go along in response to a, a question that, that they weren't anticipating. I think being being very clear about what the extent of your knowledge is and isn't is is key because you'll get found out quite quickly. If you then take all of that and say, okay, how do you embed that into good decision making? I think first of all, when do you do it? Well, from my perspective, as early as possible. I think you've got you generally, as an authority, you'll be putting together, and and you know, all the bidders would have, would have done this as well. You put together a team of people that, with different skills. You need them all involved from day one, because otherwise, uh, if you realise too late that you haven't involved someone, you will inevitably waste time and resource, and uh, and that's not not a sensible thing to do. Um, then how do you do it? Well, in a very integrated way. So, uh, you know, a good project manager or project director of an auction will will as uh, be assessing constantly who needs to be involved in which decision at which time. Uh, and there are, I think it's very important to be to be clear that you value and and listen to each of the different types of expertise in your team uh, as equally as possible. Because if you end up with too much of a hierarchy, uh, you'll end up being skewed towards someone's personal personal views. And actually, as an authority, you won't make very good decisions overall. I don't think. I think clarity of roles, therefore, is absolutely key. Um, you need to be very clear about who is making what decision at what time. And there will be different answers for that at different stages. So at the policy development stage, um, you, you probably want to have quite open discussions where everyone is chipping in. You're, you're putting everything onto the table. You're trying to work out what you want to do. And you want all of your experts involved uh, together. When you when you get to you also by the way want some you'll probably want individual experts then to be ready to actually explain where you've got to to people who might make a decision but but are not are not the expert themselves. When it comes to sort of challenge, and I think challenge comes in two phases. One is internal challenge where you are stress testing what you're proposing to do to make sure that it actually stands up. Uh, you you want experts to be able to to take on that role. There may also be a bit of persuasion involved in terms of persuading decision makers that this is the right way to go. So experts will be performing different different roles at different times and everything. Um, we've talked about the court where obviously you need experts to, to, to actually be real experts and to show that to the court and, and to be helpful. Um, in running the auction, the actual implementation stage, um, certainly our experience at Ofcom has been that you, you want absolute clarity of what type of decision have we got in front of us, and you want to know in advance who is it who is going to make that decision, who has the authority to make it, and you want to have decided that well in advance because you don't want to be deciding it in the moment. Um, and there, sometimes the expert will need to make the decision because it, it's something that requires particular expertise. And sometimes the expert will be advising someone else who needs to make the decision about what the risks are of doing this, that, or the other, what the options are. And then ultimately someone else makes that decision. And, and it, uh, certainly the way we've tended to do it, you, you end up with you know the, the most, in a sense, the most onerous decisions probably don't get taken by the expert, but certainly on advice. So if you have to say exclude someone from an auction part way through because something because they've breached a rule, that will probably go quite high up in your organisation for a decision. But the decision will be will will rely heavily on what the expertise that that has the experts in the room are advising you to do. And um, and then finally, yeah, I have I have to leave. I've got a class to teach, so I want to just say goodbye. Uh, to everyone. Goodbye, Jeffrey. Congratulations again. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. And your students are very lucky people. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, okay. Sorry, I, was, I, was, I was pretty much done there. I, I would say, therefore, I think that clarity of, of how you use your experts and when you use them is, is very important. And to, to maybe finish on a cricketing analogy for uh, for Jeff and I, I actually wasn't I wasn't going to use cricket, but I think it works for this. I, I think it works for everything. It works for most things. I do agree with that. Um, 
I think your team of experts is a little bit like a good cricket 11. Uh, different people have different skills and they come to the fore at different times of the of the different stages of your auction. And if you use them well, collectively, you will get a good result. If you don't and rely too much on, on, on individuals at the wrong times, uh, it'll go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, no further comment. Even that analogy has been made. Okay, so we now have um, lots of time for um, for questions. Uh, so I'm going to go first of all to those in the room. But those of you who are joining online, please do put your questions in the in the Q and A, and we'll be coming to you as well. Um, okay, first off, Mark. There we go. Um, so you have to use the mic quite sure. Great, thank you. Amit Nagpal from EV Consulting. So I just wanted to pick up on one of the points that you made, Inga, about uh, information availability. And when I sort of sort of read all the textbooks many years ago about auctions and the likes, they all talk about you know full transparency is the way to get an efficient outcome. But you know, having participated in many auctions now, it's very, very rare that you have all the information of who's bidding on what, how much they've bid on, and so on. And I just wondered, is this all about just raising the price, which ultimately is not what regulators are supposed to do? You know, what, why isn't it fully transparent in line with what the theory says? Well, I'm no longer at Ofcom, but when I was at Ofcom, Ofcom doesn't have, doesn't set any auction design on the basis of revenue. There's no statute for uh, uh, a duty relating to revenue raising, and all the decisions are justified by reference to the other objectives I've talked about in terms of efficient allocation or promoting competition and coverage, for example. So I think the design decision that I've been involved in and what I talk about actually in the book on that question of the information policy is you've got to strike a trade-off. And the concern you have actually is what I was talking about in terms of strategic bidding. Now, strategic bidding sometimes doesn't distort the allocation, doesn't distort efficiency, but it can do. You know, and, and there are many different types of strategic bidding, whether it's forcing up someone else's price, or Paul Morgan referred to market division, which is splitting the spectrum kind of between you at a, at a low price and potentially at a at an inefficient allocation. So I think there's the, the trade-off. On the one hand, yes, absolutely, more transparency to bidders is better and it facilitates the efficiency side of that equation. But also, if bidders know exactly what other bidders are doing, it does make it easier for them to engage in some types of strategic bidding. And so that's why I suspect most regulators have struck that balance. Um, and uh, and in fact, you know, in the in the uh, in the 2021 auction and indeed 2018 in the UK, there was a deliberate, you know, reduction in the in the precision of the information bidders got because that because Ofcom judged that trade off had tilted a bit. There was greater concerns about strategic bidding um, compared to compared to as it were the norm. But it, if you don't have so many, so much concerns, uh, thinking about the likely bidders, the situation, the risks of different types of, uh, of different strategic bidding, then, then I think you, you can and should be more, more transparent. But full transparency, I understand they do it in Germany, for example, and it seems to be okay there, although someone once told me that's because the operators hate each other so much they don't want to collude. Um, <laughs> some people in the room are nodding, you know more about German auctions than I do. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, so that's just, you know, that's, that's, I mean, that was a joke, but it's also <laughs> it's also to try and illustrate that the design choices you make really depend on the your understanding of the situation. Sometimes that can be really, you know, cultural, local conditions can really make a difference as well. Uh, excellent. Yeah. Can I comment on that? Um, so, as you say, Jeffrey, it's it's, it's weighing up a uh, risk of collusion, if you like, or strategic bidding versus risk of an inefficient outcome because bidders can't see what's going on, which is actually important to them. But um, observation from the outside, <laughs> do not mean to offend anyone here, but perhaps we talked about risk before, but perhaps some regulator also, some regulators, sorry, also more worried about the risk of collusion and therefore kind of erring on the side of preventing that rather than exploring uh, in more detail, what types of information could be released uh, over the course of the auction um, with little risk to um, uh, facilitating strategic bidding? I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I agree with you. I, I think, though, there is a potential, at least, for a slight difference in perspective between bidders sure, and course. regulators here. You know, bidders obviously are interested in, you know, achieving good commercial outcomes, et cetera. 
and that's perfect, I'm completely amused to it. Uh, but certain types of strategic bidding, they might actually, obviously, some of them work well for bidders, you know, in, in allow them to, uh, you know, market division, for example, is about getting more profit, getting the, winning the spectrum cheaply. Um, so there are certain types of strategic bidding which actually regulators are less concerned about than bidders, and actually the opposite also applies on, on other types. So I agree with your general point. It's about assessing the risks of strategic bidding relative to you know, the importance of uh, greater transparency of information to allow bidders to sort of generally you know, express the richness of their, of their valuations. And that's always going to be in the dark. You don't know the answer to all of those things. It's obviously a judgment call. But I think, you know, I think regulators and bidders are always likely to disagree on some aspects of that because of that difference of perspective. Excellent. Um, I think you have another question there. Thanks. Thank you, William Webb from Access Partnership. Uh, auctions have become the default approach for awarding cellular and spectrum for generally good reasons, but I wonder if we're too quick these days to reach for them. So if I take, for example, the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum and the 5G auctions, in most countries, it was kind of obvious the outcome was going to be all the existing operators are going to share the spectrum between them. And indeed, that's what happened in most countries, including the UK. Wouldn't it have been easier in that case just to award it directly to those operators without an auction process? And indeed, often regulators push things in that direction these days with spectrum caps that prevent too much inequality in, in outcomes because they rightly want to maintain competitive pressure. So I wonder if we perhaps shouldn't reach for auctions all the time. I mean, obviously, you know, taking your example of the sort of the key 5G spectrum in, in, in Europe, particularly, um, uh, I mean, it was obvious, I think you could say that, that the large operators were going to win some, but were they all going to win the same amount? Is it, is it efficient for them to win the same amount? So, I mean, it's one thing to say, say, you know, we can identify who the winners are going to be, but what exact amounts are they going to win or should they win for, for efficiency reasons? So it's not always, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, depending on the amount available, it may not be obvious and, and an equal split may not be the right answer because different operators have different pre-existing spectrum holdings, they have different commercial strategies, and indeed that's a good thing, right? You want them to do that because that's likely to enrich, enrich competition. So symmetry isn't always a good thing, I mean, it isn't always a good thing for competition. It, it can be, but it can also kind of dampen competition. So I, I actually would, I think, would argue that, that in that particular case for those bands, so important. I think you needed, you know, the information from the market, from the bidding, in order to really derive, in some cases, some sort of, some of those marginal questions, you know, does this operator win a bit of a larger block or a smaller block uh, than, than others? And on your other point about spectrum caps, I, I think I... I agree that, you know, spectrum craps are often quite restrictive and sometimes too restrictive, you know, not that I know the, the full details of what's driven all of those decisions in other countries. The UK has used spectrum caps, occasionally they've been quite tight, but they've generally been allowed plenty of space to allow a wide range of different auction outcomes. If you're narrowing down the auction outcomes so much by having really tight spectrum caps, then I think your question becomes much more relevant. Why do you spend all the time and effort going through a really complicated and long-winded process of designing auctions if, if the scope for, for the difference in outcome is very limited because of the caps? I would definitely echo that. I mean, I was going to start by saying it's, it's quite a bold move to uh, advocate less spectrum auctions at the book launch of a book about spectrum auctions. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> but I, I, think it's, I think it's a very fair question. <laughs> Looking at it sort of maybe from a, from, from a sort of a decision maker's or lawyer's perspective, you've got to have a good alternative, I think. And if, if, and you, your alternative has got to be at least as good as the auction will be. I mean, yeah, instinctively, auctions take an enormous amount of resource to plan, run and you know, deliver. So uh, I don't think we would do it if we didn't think there was, you know, if we thought there was a better way of doing it, I think we'd often search for that. Um, but the alternative might seem very obvious in hindsight. I think it doesn't always, is not quite as obvious in advance. Uh, a, you don't know whether you're going to get any new entrants sometimes. And obviously if you, if you decide as the regulator, I'm simply going to parcel it out in this way. You are making a decision about what the market is going to look like. And generally, I think regulators 
avoid or try to avoid making decisions about what markets will look like that they will prefer to leave the market to try and work that out itself maybe with some guidance and some 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 limits but you know and the alternative maybe the obvious alternative is what well, okay you do a beauty contest you've still got to have some objectively justifiable criteria of how you're going to pick who you're going to give stuff to and how much you're going to give to them and I guarantee that not everyone who goes into that process will will agree with you <laughs> with your outcome uh, either in advance or or afterwards. Um, so you you would need you know uh, the auction provides you with a neat way of saying you we will make it available to you. You now decide amongst yourselves essentially how you get there. And it's and it's certainly from a legal perspective much more defensible. I think. Just. Um... I think the, the example you used, uh, William, is, is maybe not the best one because in that question, there, there is perhaps an obvious um, answer and way of divvying it up. But um, just more generally, because I was thinking about this question of symmetry or asymmetry as well, Jeffrey, in terms of spectrum medications and what is more pro-competitive um, than the other. And I think the, 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 the power of a of some asymmetry around the edges in what is quite a competitive downstream market in an industry that might look like what isn't fully properly sort of from the outside is quite important. And, and regulators can really harness that actually much more than I think a lot of regulators realize. Um, you know, the example in the UK that you're well aware of as well, Martin, it was the launch of 4G where we were all, you know, we were a bit behind the curve, frankly, in the UK. And having the opportunity with one operator to go ahead and the others are needed to catch up, I think, unlocked things because it really stirred <laughs> competitive uh, forces to, um, to make that happen. Um, so I, I think in most cases, probably not. I, I know that Inga was working for the uh, operator that, that got the head started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that might happen. I do but agree. Yeah. I do understand. agree. I think I think I think that's one of the points going back to you know William, part of William's questions about spectrum caps. You know, I I think the UK approach I find I was involved in it, so perhaps I would say this, but I think it's quite attractive in that it's a you know it's allowed plenty of asymmetry, and sometimes that's been hugely contentious. I mean, caps are inherently contentious because they usually affect different operators differently, and mm -hmm. um, so. Um, but the UK approach has usually been, you know, laxer caps than, than have been adopted in some other countries. And, and in, you know, the UK, historically, the UK, and it's indeed still today, the UK distribution of, of mobile spectrum between operators has significant degrees of asymmetry, whether you look at total spectrum, low frequency spectrum, 5G spectrum, etc. And that can be, I mean, I think it's actually a very open question about whether symmetry or asymmetry is better for, for competition. And I certainly don't think it's true that symmetry is always better. And asymmetry, and then the question is how much asymmetry, right? So, so how much asymmetry should you allow? But I, but I think it's probably uh, desirable to allow, to allow uh, uh, asymmetry because it can have upsides as long as you've got to make that judgment call about what's too much. Okay, now these remarks have been quite, so I've got a person at the back there who's desperate to get in, and then I've got two on Zoom, and I've got somebody on the wall, and then you and the shirt over there, and then I've got a flurry of hands. Right, everybody. You're a pretty exciting okay. so, lot of people. It's desperate, but keen at least. Um, Simon Saunders, first of all, congratulations on the book, yes. Jeffrey. I confess I haven't finished it yet, but I've read enough to know that... Um, the, the value relative to the price is really good. <laughs> um, so, so my question is kind of a counterpoint to Williams. Uh, of course, as the picture on the cover of the book gives away, these aren't really spectrum auctions, they're mobile spectrum auctions specifically, and they've been tuned over time with assumptions about the nature of the mobile market. And there are three assumptions that I think are looking increasingly soft. And I welcome your thoughts as to what that means for auctions. And, and in particular, the, the assumptions are, number one, that mobile is a scale game for big, wide area operators only. It clearly is. But increasingly, there are other things which involve other entities, including large scale private users building networks themselves. Secondly, that 
mobile is a gross game. It clearly is a gross game, but gross rates are reducing quite substantially over time. And perhaps we could imagine a world where growth rates are more at the kind of single digit levels that fixed broadband is in today, not the explosive, conceptually exponential, but definitely not in practice growth rates. So that, that story is shifting. And then thirdly, the once mobile spectrum finds its hand its way into the hands of operators through sophisticated auctions, that they will put it to good use. And often regulators don't actually see how spectrum is used in practice some years after the, the spectrum's got out there. Now you may disagree with the softness of some of those assumptions, but I think they are baked in. And I'd be very interested in your views as to if those in, assumptions indeed are are weakened over time, what that means for future auctions. It's kind of the opposite to William's point of view <laughs> that you know it's not obvious where the best value use of the spectrum might be given those those changes in conditions. Thank you. And then we'll go to um, those on Zoom, on Zoom. Don't worry, I'm going to come to you um, after this one. I mean, I don't assume uh, that that auctions is always the right answer. I do think that should be a conscious choice and it should be reflect the nature of, I mean, I talk probably more in the book about the nature of the spectrum, but I mean, the, the wider circumstance, who the potential users are, what their interests are. And, you know, for the very high frequency and much higher frequency bands that are now being uh, uh, awarded and, and Ofcom is in the process of thinking about it. It's a uh, award process for the um, so-called millimeter wave spectrum. It isn't proposing, I mean, it's got consultation proposals out there. It isn't proposing to auction everything. It's proposing a mixed model, auction some, others more on a sort of first come, first serve basis with local licensing. And that, I don't know whether that affects what you call the, weak, the weakening assumptions, but it certainly reflects the, the nature of that spectrum. The fact that the signals don't travel nearly as far and so it's inherently much more localized. So there's a much stronger case for sort of localized licensing. Um, um, but also the potential for a much wider set of users to be interested in using similar spectrum that the mobile operators do. And, you know, I, I think, I agree you should be very open to that uh, 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 because, uh, you know, it's, it, if every, I mean, it, it, there's also a question here about, if you like, the regulatory process, right? You, with regulators, you, you, you spend a lot of time talking to the well-defined stakeholders who have very clear interests, their existing operators, they have a completely appropriate input into that process. But the ones it's hard to get input on, input from, is those who aren't in the room, in the metaphorical room. They are putative players, or they might be interested in something and they don't quite know, they're not used to interacting with the regulator, maybe they don't have the the in-house expertise about some of the spectral questions as well, it's kind of harder to engage with those stakeholders. And I think it is incumbent on regulators to be quite proactive, to try and understand those interests and take them seriously. And that may lead to a mixed models or deciding that something shouldn't be auctioned. I mean, you know, not everything should be auctioned. Excellent. Martin, what do you think? This works so I can shout. This <laughs> anyway, so I've got two questions and I'll do them as package. So, um, you know, sort of my my voice here. So one question from Brett Tanutza, who also reflects on the US broadcast incentive auction about keeping it simple for the bidders, has a, a question about uh, perspectives of how regulators can best understand the bidder perspective, taking in this point about the war room and uh, as a conscientious objector, I find war rooms difficult. But uh, you know, that's sort of, anyway. So, so so how as a you know when you know how can a regulator best understand what actually you know, the bidder might experience in the war room, you know, when a regulator sits in comfortable armchairs and you know, <laughs> runs without simulation. <laughs> um, so the you know, war room feels very different to the Herman Miller chairs of the regulator. <laughs> um, uh, secondly, um, a question from Richard Marston, who basically, um, you know, questions, uh, you usually dealt with four to five mobile national operators, but um, does that make auction design easier or harder relative to countries where you only have three or less operators. Okay, who wants to, who wants to go first? <laughs> Shall I try the first one? I mean, at, at one level, you know, we consult quite quite extensively. And so I think we, we give people plenty of opportunity generally to tell us 
what they want and what they're interested in and what matters to them. And so the bigger the bigger operators are in fairly regular contact with the regulator. Uh, and so I think there is an understanding there. That said, when it comes to, to sitting in the war room actually bidding, it's sort of over to them at that point. You know, we, we will have set the rules. We will be we will then be trying to work out how how do you best run this auction in a way that works well for the bid in a sense for all of the bidders and and allows you to get to an outcome as ideally as soon as possible. Um, so I think dialogue is is obviously the best answer there. Listen, you know, regulators need to listen to operators what they're telling them. That said, regulators are also aware that operators have quite understandably and quite rightly their own interests at heart. They will tell you what what they want you to do that will that will benefit them. And, and a good regulator hopefully takes all of that together and tries to come up with a, a solution that best meets both the regulator's objectives and hopefully the, the industry's objectives. But it won't it won't meet everyone's objectives perfectly. Yeah, so, so my perspective that I can imagine it's quite difficult as a regulator and you've got people like myself who are full-time employed and operated to go and advocate um, you know, what we want. So I can imagine it's quite difficult from a regulator's perspective to um, tell the difference, if you like, <laughs> between what is a bit of trying to advocate for this, that, or the other outcome that will benefit them um, and to differentiate that from what is what is actually the situation, what is actually going on with that bidder, what is actually really important for that bidder. I, I think that is quite, uh, I can imagine it's quite difficult. Um, one trick that I have uh, tried actually before, way back when I was a consultant, I was asked by a regulator that I was advising um, uh, on spectrum auctions to actually go around to the different bidders and ask them what was really important to them. So, so that regulator decided to get a third party, if you like, to try and go around and elicit that information. Perhaps because they thought that might make that exchange easier. But it's difficult, I think. I was just going to re reflect on um, uh, the, the, the last uh, UK auction in 2021. I mean, it was originally going to be held in 2020, but some of you may re recall what was going on in the world in 2020. So uh, this wasn't the ideal time to get people stuck together in close proximity in, in small <laughs> auction rooms. Um, but the delay also meant that Ofcom, I think, paid a lot of attention to speaking to the operators, understanding operationally, you know, in terms of obviously all the design decisions being made by them, but there were still big questions as Martin was referring to earlier about how you run the auction, the pace at which you run the auction, how you set prices from one round to another, what kind of deposits you ask for and when you ask for them, how you ask for them, et cetera. And I think there are some very practical examples of, of uh, uh, the regulator there speaking to the different operators, understanding their point of view, actually getting some of their, where they're part of larger groups, getting their experiences in some other countries that have held auctions, getting feedback, well, this is how it worked in this auction in Netherlands or whatever it was. Um, and that was actually very interesting and, and very useful. And there were some operational practical decisions made on the basis of that, about, you know, how price increases could be set to make it more predictable in advance. Um, and to uh, and to assist the kind of deposit uh, process, which I mean, Ofcom historically has taken a quite rigorous approach to asking for bidders to top up their deposits, and that means they've got to go through internal governance processes to to uh, to authorize the, the the money that's required, and so they want a degree of predictability, completely understandably about that. So I think there were some efforts to try and have, to increase predictability, which I think is a good thing in general, but it was accentuated, I think, by the, the pandemic and the complications that that introduced in a practical way and the second question that came through oh, which yes. was numbers of days for the size numbers you want to uh yeah uh, so so small number of players yes well i think you, you I mean, my immediate thought is you, you get increasingly worried i would say that this may be my paranoia as a as a former regulator about market division or or those kind of those kind of strategic bidding because obviously the fewer players there are, the easier it is for them to know what each other wants and to be able to coordinate uh, their, their, their behavior in the auction. Um, so for example, in the, in, the, in the 2021 auction, in one of the bands, there were only three bidders. There are only four bidders in the, in the whole auction, but there were four bidders in one of the bands and, and three bidders in the other main band. Um, and I think I set out the book, I think there was market division going on there. I think it was quite clear evidence of, uh, of tacit collusion going on. 
which was facilitated by very specific circumstances of, of the kind of the equal split being you know not just uh, symmetric and and, and uh, obvious but also uh, they all had very strong interest to 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 get uh, uh, those amounts so I, I think that's probably my instinctive reaction is you'd be quite concerned about you know the, some of those issues about striking these trade-offs worrying perhaps even more about the information policy questions but you always got to uh, you know you also, I think, got to think about how much does that matter for your objectives? And actually, you know, this 2021 auction, I think, um, provides a, a good example. Um, Ofcom was aware of that risk before the auction. And there would be this market division in the in the 3.6 uh, uh, gigahertz band. Um, and I think there probably was. But it was very plausibly an efficient allocation, as it happens. And... Um, so I think Ofcom was actually more relaxed about it. There could have been things that could have been done. You could have chosen different different auction design decisions, set different reserve prices, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, you've always got to think about some, I think I made the point earlier, some types of strategic bidding do distort efficiency and some may not. And in fact, that auction I call short and sweet because the bidding didn't last very long and it led to what looks like a reasonably efficient allocation, even though it was in the case of that band, a very uncompetitive bidding process. But may I just add, I mean, Jeffrey, from the auctions I've been in, I've never been in a position where we've been anywhere near able to collude. There are just too many measures um, in the auction. So I think I come back to what I said before that I feel maybe from a regulated perspective that trade-off between those risks is a little bit balanced too, too much in the, um, in the direction of avoiding collusion because I think it's actually quite rare. Um, and then this may be reflected on what you said earlier, Martin, when you were talking about the use of experts. Now, of course, from a bit of perspective, it's kind of the other way around. You need to include as few people as possible in your bit of preparations. But for this reason, you need to really keep the knowledge about what your values are and what your bid strategy is um, tight, um, as tight as you can, but obviously needing to um, uh, involve your, um, their, you know, your senior management and your board. So um, from, from my perspective, and I completely appreciate Jeffrey, it's a different perspective, but the risk of collusion is, is not great. Uh, even in auctions with very few bidders, and even if they don't hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had a question over. Wait, I Thank you, uh, Mark Haynes. Very nice to see lots of old friends um, that I've worked off gone for a long time, and Jeffrey taught me an awful lot about auctions. Um, this may be more of a question for Inga, actually, but it, and it might be, it's not as heretical as William's question, <laughs> uh, but it's not far off. So my question is, for a bidder, does price discovery really matter? Because my theory is you sit down with a big spreadsheet beforehand and figure out how much spectrum's worth, you know what your use case is. I can see that the amount that other people get makes a difference, but the price you pay is not actually particularly material. It just determines how much profit you make. So the question is, do we need to worry about price discovery, which is an article of faith? And I understand common value uncertainty, private value uncertainty, and so on, but does it matter? Nice small questions here, that's good. <laughs> Well, it's doing yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from my experience, uh, Matt, uh, yes, I have been in one auction where we revised our valuations partway through on the basis of what we saw. Uh, but in the other, but only that one time in the other auctions, we have had our valuations. And as you said, it's been a question of what we ended up paying. I will actually add something, which I think actually goes back to a point Inga made earlier about different types of bidders. You know, large, well-resourced, experienced bidders put a lot of effort into valuations and, you know, and, you know quite how, you know, whether they're sort of all nailed down before the auction. But, you know, they may be, may be very useful for less experienced bidders to have opportunities to revise what they think as things go along and they get a better understanding of what's going on. So I can see, you know, maybe it is sometimes overstated. You know, the underlying fear, as you sort of briefly referred to, was the kind of common value uncertainty. There's a, there's a wider point, I think, just about fairness of process and your bit of understanding what's going on. And obviously, you know, 
you have an opportunity to, as it were, bid back in various auction designs. Um, if it's just a one-shot seal bid, you put in your bids, the answer pops out and it can be very unexpected. Now that's both a strength and a weakness, but um, you know, it can have upside not knowing what other bidders are, are, are doing and obviously it can, can have disadvantages. So I, I think it's, uh, it's probably a bit context specific. It can be kind of easy, I think, just to kind of assume it's going to be very important. Um, but I think there are circumstances where it's going to matter. Hi, Robbie Barado. I had the pleasure of working with Jeffrey as well. Probably got talked quite a lot. Um, but my, my question is around uh, to design an auction, the regulator has to has to talk to everyone and, and stakeholders. And Inga, you touched on it uh, as well. And my experience of it is you get pulled into 20 different directions. And I think in the book, Jeffrey, you talk about, well, you use an auction because talk is cheap. And <laughs> And and you know that's uh, that's a fair experience in my in my view. But uh, Martin, you talked about the objectives of the auction, and often it's to help bidders to actually provide a network. And and I guess I wanted to to ask Inga and Jeffrey as as on two opposing sides. When when do you listen to, to bidders, to potential bidders, and and actually when do you kind of go, no, it's better to be simple, as everyone kind of on the panel roughly is pulling in that direction. And for example, you said in twenty thirteen. We obviously shouldn't have had that rule, uh, but how do you as the regulator know beforehand? So I'm, I guess I'm just wondering, where's that balance? And Inga, do you think it's the right balance? Has it gone too far one way or the other? So just an, another easy question. <laughs> shall, I, shall I start in that? Um, actually, uh, I mean, I kind of agree, certainly in retrospect with the, with the observation Inga made, and it's in the book as well about the, 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 the competition between low power and high power for part of the, the, uh, the 2.6 gigahertz spectrum, the 4G capacity spectrum in, in that auction. The reason it was there was actually because there was significant lobbying by one of the stakeholders uh, who, who very much wanted it. And it felt at the time uh, like a, 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 a tricky decision to make as a prior policy judgment. Um, and, uh, and therefore it seemed useful to leave it to the auction. As it happened, there was just no meaningful bidding. And so it, it kind of clearly didn't, didn't work out. So maybe that's an example of where Ofcom shouldn't have listened to that uh, particular uh, uh, bidder. Um, I mean, there's no easy answers to that. You've just got to judge things on their own merits. You obviously always need to recognize who, with whatever uh, stakeholder you're discussing with, they have their own point of view, they have their own interests and it's completely useful they reflect that. You should recognise that's what's what's going on, and that, uh, uh, and you need to, I think, put it together with other points of view as well. I think that's like a sort of broader point. That's about the importance of getting a diversity of, of, of views. And if everyone is saying the same thing, even people who you think it's not obvious that they do have a self interest in saying that, or they don't have the same self interest in saying it, it's more persuasive than if you just have one, you know, everyone's saying something different, and you, you know, and uh, and there's no kind of Unanimity, or, or even you know, close to consensus view. Um, I, I said before, I think it's really difficult. It must be really difficult from a regulator um, perspective to kind of discern what's what's cheap talk and what is actually really critical. Um, but perhaps, uh, perhaps another way for the regulator uh, to, to talk to those stakeholders and Ofcom has always been very open to talk to stakeholders is to maybe try and go one step further and understand why the stakeholder is saying that is it just to try and you know get 10 megahertz in that band cheaper than you know x or is there actually some sort of rationale that is really quite important to um, their business so, so that's what I think I would try and do is to kind of dig deeper and try and understand why is saying that? I, I totally agree with that. But talk is still cheap, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, it's about you know, if you ask them why, or you trying to envisage why, you know, and they may say one thing, but is that always the truth, yeah. or is that always the complete truth? Shall yeah. we say? It's it's uh, as you say, it's uh, that's just kind of you know, I mean, some of the underlying sort of economic theory about regulation, just generally, is about asymmetric information is the fundamental problem. You know, and so. That's always uh, that's always about whatever kind of regulatory judgment you have to make, but it's, it's sometimes easier in some cases and very very difficult in others. Yeah. 
and trust is important as well, as you sure, mentioned, I, I, in terms of sharing information. Yeah. Okay, right. So another flurry. <laughs> so uh, first of all, over there, and then in the middle, and then uh, back over there. I don't know, but it needs a mic. It needs a mic. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, Graham Mouth, you probably do know me. Um, I was the director at Spectrum Policy at Ofcom that ran most of these auctions, or at least a good proportion of them. Um, first of all, Jeffrey, congratulations on a book, on the book, sorry. Um, I think we're missing something here. We're talking a lot about very sophisticated regulators. There are hundreds of regulators out there who have no clue about any of this stuff, and your book is absolutely marvellous. And it should be compulsory reading for absolutely every one of them. I'm serious. It should be compulsory reading for absolutely every one of them and for every ministry out there as well, because there are lots of examples outside Europe predominantly, although even European regulators get it wrong, of regulators making a complete mess of spectrum auctions in all sorts of different ways. Um, so some, I mean, the book is absolutely marvellous in that respect. You should be selling hundreds of copies into all of those markets around the world where, where this is, yeah, this needs to be understood properly and it isn't at the moment. Um, right, that said, uh, the, question for the, panel, the question for the panel. Uh, a lot of talk earlier about innovation. Um, absolutely agree, we need some more innovation. But what I'd like to hear from the panel is in, in what areas of spectrum auction design delivery implementation should we be innovating Inga, you've already mentioned information policy absolutely but what are, what are the other areas i mean we, we all agree that there is no one i hope we all agree there is no one perfect auction design we've got a toolkit but what what are the gaps in the toolkit what are the things that we the, the issues that we need to address which we aren't addressing as well as perhaps we should do and therefore where we should be looking to innovate thank you So taking the first part of your question, I, I really agree with you. Right? <laughs> uh, 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 Graham, sorry. Um, uh, slightly undermined the agreement, didn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, uh, and indeed, you know, I kind of said that at the start of my opening remarks is that was very much one of the things I had in mind was, was I've got deep experience in UK auctions. I have very little, I mean, no direct experience in other auctions and, you know, I haven't participated in any others. But obviously you look around and you see a range of experiences and a range of you know obvious design flaws and obvious process problems and that was very much the audience that i had in mind in writing the book was to try you know it's one of the reasons why uh, I, I draw out these analytical frameworks i see ofcon college was smiling when i said that because they'd heard me banging on about the importance of analytical frameworks in the past or, or the f word as it was someone sometimes known in my presence <laughs> but no, no, I just want to reiterate that was that was absolutely one of the, one of the objectives is to uh, is to try and reach out to those people and that's why actually you know it, I'm actually very happy that this is an open access uh, mm -hmm. application is it makes it easier I think to get into the hands of the people who can uh, who can uh, who can hopefully make good use of it. On the on the second question about where should we innovate. Um, I mean, innovation is, well, innovation is usually a, or in this context, is a response to problems or a response to new challenges. I'm sure there are some other cases as well, but those are the two that spring to mind. If there's a problems, I'm not quite sure what the innovation is, but it just feels like reserve prices is something that's often quite badly in a lot of places. Um, and, you know, anyway, that was one of the reasons I highlighted it, often quite highlighted it when I give an example of a, of a framework. Um, and I think there may be an area there where I think I made the observation in the book that a lot of other design decisions are quite strongly informed by underlying theory. Reserve price choices often aren't because the theory is much more basic and doesn't address sort of asymmetric bidders and these kind of auction, uh, spectrum auction setups. So maybe that's a place where there might be some value for that sort of two way learning that I talked about between between uh, academics and, and practitioners. Um, beyond that, I think on the challenges front, I, you know, I, I find it slightly hard to answer that in the abstract because I think it depends on the particular challenge. You know, Paul Mergren, for example, talked about the broadcast incentive auction, which he, you know, essentially designed or, was, or led the design team. And that was to crack some 
difficult allocation problems, but also the very difficult technical questions as well about repacking the band when it was taken, uh, obtained from the from the broadcasters to to make it available to the mobile operators. So I think it probably depends a bit on the challenges in, in that in that category. Anything I'd add would be I I wonder whether actually your question ought to be broadened out, and it's it's not just a spectrum auction question. It's actually a a, a spectrum allocation technique question and as you know spectrum auctions i've said before take a long time we all know that they are sort of fairly big set piece events that happen every three four years or, or longer but actually the underlying use of the spectrum changes remarkably quickly and will and i think that will only increase and so i think a challenge for us as a as a regulator is actually how do you get how do you change the use of spectrum or get the spectrum out to different people when they actually need it uh, in a in a more agile, quick way? Uh, now that won't necessarily work for big big bands on which the the mobile operators base their you know the fundamentals of their business, but certainly at the edges, and I suspect those edges will become will become very much more central. In fact, and core. I suspect the, the big challenge for us and other regulators is getting is getting that spectrum available more quickly. Thank you very much. I'm Steve Babbage, now an independent consultant. Um, I've seen uh, multiple round auctions, not in the UK, but elsewhere in Europe, um, where after a certain number of rounds, Demand has almost reduced to fit within supply. And then two operators battling over the last little tiny marginal amount has pushed up the prices hugely for all winners in that in that band and every lot in that band. Is, is that just efficient allocation at work or is that a failure of design or something else? Well, I guess it sort of depends what was driving the bidding, but if it was, you know, if it's bidders reflecting their valuations and that sort of, you know, and one wins and the other loses, or at least at the margin, those two fighting it out, then that's indicating the opportunity cost of the spectrum and the, and the market value. So in that sense, I think there is certainly a case for that being an efficient outcome. Um, there could be other things going on as well, which may not fit quite so neatly into that sort of efficiency story. I mean, what may underline your question as well, I don't know, is also about pricing. Should everyone face that that price? Well, if it genuinely reflects the opportunity cost, then actually they should. It is, you know, you do want the winners to be to have their value exceeding the, the opportunity cost, typically the value to the sort of highest losing bidder. So I, I suppose I'm instinctively feel uh, uh, feel inclined to sort of emphasize the efficiency aspects of that. But you know, there can be other things driving bidding, and sometimes it can take just far too long to reach that resolution, which just extends the, the auction process just in, in terms of time, just, just too much, even if it ultimately leads to quite a sensible outcome. Thank you, Chris Cheeseman from BT. I just wanted to say I agree it's an excellent book. I have sort of read it from cover to cover. It touched a raw nerve in a few places. <laughs> <laughs> I've sort of been in almost all the auctions and uh, it's away in Barcelona. And one evening uh, I just read it with a glass of wine and uh, it got better as the, <laughs> as the evening went. But um, <laughs> so just to get to my point, to come back on the low power 2.6 gigs license, I, I was sort of involved in that. And I think actually from a bidder's perspective, my recollection is there was a, a sort of free rider problem. And I think there was no bids because um, it was a design issue in, in my view that if somebody wanted a license and bid for it, you'd have to sort of bid up to almost the cost of a standard license and then the auction design meant that all the other bidders would effectively get one for free and uh, so for us uh, I was involved in that auction I think it's so long ago I'm free to sort of probably <laughs> talk about it but we felt there was a design issue there and the, the lack of bids I think it was one company I think O2 placed one bid but uh, even though BT had advocated for it we didn't actually bid because we we were concerned with on the design there, but um, anyway, excellent book. And as I say, you, you've got to, you've 
spot on on a, a, a lot of things that made me think. <laughs> okay, so we've got, um, we are slightly over time, but I just wanted to give a final opportunity for Carol to make a few final remarks and reflections. Oh, okay. You can also respond. <laughs> I'll go very quickly. I will, I, will, I will also say many congratulations on the book. I think, I think it is an enormously useful book for people who are you know, not just across the world, I'm sure it is, but actually I, I think of people joining Ofcom, you know, who not everyone joins Ofcom with a deep knowledge of spectrum and spectrum auctions. It'll surprise you to, to learn. And I think it's an enormously useful uh, book for people to, to get into the subject. So, um, so thank you for writing it. Yeah, can I, can I pick up on what you said, uh, Graham, earlier about how useful this book would be to um, other regulators um, with less expertise. But when I read it as well, we discussed this a little bit, um, Jeffrey, I thought, well, actually, it has much wider applications than just spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, recently, for example, um, auctions or allocations of uh, rights to develop off offshore wind farms is the craze. And, you know, not I think not so much in the UK, we use uh, competitive allocation methods. But if you look across Europe, Denmark, where I've recently practiced in the Netherlands, I mean, some of the methods that are being used for the allocation of those rights are similar to where we were with beauty contests for spectrum auctions 20 years ago. So to the colleagues from LSE Press, definitely market this book <laughs> widely, uh, also to other sectors. And it would be wonderful to see also all that public policy experience on behalf of regulators broadened out uh, to benefit regulators in other industries. Thank you. Next edition, Jeffrey. Thank you. Well, <laughs> yes, it will take a bit of research. I think to say those contexts is sufficient detail. But I, no, I was very interested to hear uh, Paul Milgram also actually referred to water auctions. Uh, mm. And you know, I can certainly have sometimes thought that there's a kind of good parallel. There's scarce natural resources, and there are definitely, I'm sure, some quite strong parallels. But you've got to understand enough about that contact with the resource and, and the and the issues and you know in order to really understand how much you can read across from one context to, to another and in, in response to 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 chris uh, I, I mean I, I i kind of agree there is a free right there is always I, was kind of, I think a bit of an inherent free rider question in that particular issue but on the other part is sort of preliminary remarks I, i'm pleased to hear that the book got better as as, as the wine went down <laughs> i'm tempted to say the book got easier to write as the uh, <laughs> uh, but just making uh, uh, a few i suppose final sort of i guess high level observations about how i think about quite a lot of these issues in a really kind of general sense we talked about quite a lot of specifics um and there's a lot of very very informed people uh, in the room i i I've definitely reflected that you know whatever point of view you have or whatever model you're using or theory you're using or point of view you have as I said it's there are there are merits to that the strengths of that but there's always going to be limitations there's always important to understand well what else you know what's the other side of the story that's why it's so important to understand those kind of strengths and limitations uh, personally I've always been very you know as a practitioner but for 30 years in in public authorities I've always been very interested in the academic literature. I've always been interested in the rigor and, and that gives you, and then uh, and then understanding how how usefully to apply that. And sometimes it isn't very applicable, and sometimes it is much much more so. But I think increasingly over time, I've grown and seen the importance of really broadening out your point of view and making sure you're very inclusive about different people who come from completely different uh, disciplines. Uh, and and have very different worldviews. It's stimulating and important to understand that. You know, I work with Martin at, at Ofcom. You know, and as a lawyer and myself as an economist, we often came to the same issue from a different point of view. And that was, you know, the kind of creative tension. You know, works well. Tension doesn't always work well, but in that in that case, it certainly did and was definitely creative and very informative. And then finally, I think, you know, I think about you should have a degree of confidence that you've got something to contribute, you know, um, uh, analytically or, 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 or as practical experience. But I think it's always important to have a degree of humility, you know, and that's why I've often actually stressed the importance of understanding regulatory failure for regulators. You're not going to get everything right. You're bound to get some things wrong. It's almost inevitable. And take account of that when you think about what to do. Humility is also, I think, a very important point. 
Excellent. Listen, we have, I know we've still got some questions uh, coming from Zoom, but I'm sure, Jeffrey, you'd be happy to perhaps take them offline if we can write yep. it down and, and you Absolutely. get back. Um, because I'm conscious we have, um, we are up against time, but the good news is that there are drinks. Um, so <laughs> I, I, oh, it's six. Yeah, so it's really fun. LSE like, oh, believes no, that nobody should be led astray before six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> oh. So uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, point at me a little bit, and the reception is just down the stairs. It's a ground floor next to the cafe. But, uh, you know, oh, um, okay, so I'm sorry. So we can go around and have a bit of time. So if there's any more questions. Or if you just want to buy the books, you know, <laughs> <laughs> then, or you want to use LSE Wi-Fi to download it, and then you know, <laughs> pay that to you. Okay, so I've, I've just closed proceedings until that point. Until now, I've closed kind of twenty minutes early, so I'm, I'm working to a different brief. Um, but I think actually we probably have used our panel enough actually, uh, and used their time. So I just want to say thank you very much and congratulations once again. Um, and I do think there is a lot to be said about taking the, the insights from this book and, and distributing them more widely. If we think about the common resources which are um, up to be allocated, not least um, carbon offsets uh, and new markets and new developments where there's a huge scope to get things very, very wrong, uh, uh, then I think there is a, a really big impetus actually to take the learnings from this, not only into other spectrum auctions elsewhere, but into that wider issue of how we allocate uh, scarce resources in the most efficient, effective, fair and transparent way. So thank you. And thank you very much, everybody.